So I need to readdress a topic from a previous podcast regarding track etiquette that's still on my mind and I haven't gotten anybody to answer my questions so I'm going to keep talking about it. In the summer I spend little I spend my running, walking, wogging time outside and I've been recently going to the track. It's narrow house. I like it cuz I can have my water always near me. It's just super convenient. So in the last week I've had multiple strange things happen. So I'm going to go down the list and still looking for someone to tell me if it's me that's the odd one and thinks it's strange or is it what I believe everyone around me is weird. So first one is there's an older guy, probably I'm going to say 75 to 85, somewhere in that range. And I'm I'm fairly observant when I'm out because it passes the time watching people. So he parks behind me, gets out of his truck, goes onto the track, and I'm like, all right, guy's getting his exercise, feeling good. He, d- <laughs> he does one lap, just one, gets back in his truck, drives away. And I thought that was interesting. Like, did that one lap extend his time with us um, and what his story was and maybe it's he's recovering for something and all he can do is one lap I don't know but I thought it was odd so the other one similar to before just more people it was a busy busy afternoon at the track it must have been holiday weekend or something but I counted including me there were 14 people going in the same direction Everybody's kind of going with the flow, right? And there's one woman who is jogging, sometimes running, going the other way of everybody. And she's dodging us like the whole time. She's having to change lanes and get around people and wait for people. And like, just, it's like driving on the freeway the wrong direction. And I keep wondering, I have to along with the rest of the people is she crazy or are we crazy? Is there some law that the track goes in a certain direction days of the week? I know they have that at Wise in certain clubs where, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, it goes one direction and the other days it goes the other, but there are no posted signs. I've been going to this track. We've lived here for 20 years. I've been doing this, never ever seen it. And she's just doesn't even acknowledge like anything's weird about it. And it was freaking me out. So the other one was two separate times, two separate, again, older, I'm going to put them between 70 and 80 men walking directly down the center of the track. They didn't pick the inside or the outside, just directly down the center. And it's a pretty busy day and people are going and having to go around them. And just, it was just odd. Most people pick a lane. So that annoyed me. And bothered me. Um, And then the other one was, and I've mentioned this before to some running friends of mine. So this woman shows up. I'd already been going for, I don't know, a few minutes. Lady shows up in full gear. Like, just went to the running store and got new shoes. And she had the camelback water thing on her back and she's got the wristbands and a fanny pack and the compression socks full running gear like just purchased it looked like and she's walking casually like incredibly slow slower than me and I'm I'm super slow these days I'm a walk jog wog occasional bursts but I, I'm I'm casual. And she was even worse than me, but she looked like she was going out for a marathon. And she left after about 20 minutes, got in her car and drove off. And I can't figure out who, where these people come from. Um, so those are things that were just bothering me this week and I'm curious about. So if you've got any track etiquette ideas, am I going the wrong direction? Is something wrong with me? Do I need to change my 
if I'm visiting the local track um, rules and regulations, I think something might be wrong. Um, so I'm, I'm recording this one again. I talked last week about trying to do some video stuff and I did a little bit this week on, I put up a post on Facebook, which is a lot of my conversation today I'm going to get to. But as usual, you can go to TikTok, which I will talk about. I've got a story on that. Um, YouTube, I put them on there. That's more just to practice and see if I can slowly learn how to use YouTube. Instagram, Facebook, you can comment. Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts and they're always talking about their podcast and pushing it and promoting it. And I'm just doing it because they do. But you're welcome to pass this um, this along to anybody you want if you think it's worthwhile. It mostly isn't. An update on my Crocs um, evolution. I've decided I now have three things I can wear Crocs to in public. That is Quick Trip. I've decided because I actually did it. I wore my Crocs to Quick Trip on accident and fit right in and it was great. So I can do Quick Trip, vacations anywhere out of town where I will not see anybody, and fishing. I did wear them fishing because I think that's logical because I could fall in the water, don't want my shoes to get gross. I think it's a logical fishing shoe. So right now I've got three reasons I can wear them outside of the house. And I wanted to mention too, if you check my Scott Fix Tennis and Pickleball Facebook, you're gonna see a post I made um, today on Sunday. Um, it's a story out of I think it was an Indianapolis news station did a short story on they now have croc boots. They look like cowboy boots, sort of, like something you might wear in the rain, um, working outside, but they're brown trying to make them look like cowboy boots. And I think I'm, I think I'm in because someday I believe I'm gonna be a croc wearer, but boots are next, so check that out if you, if you can. Um, I mentioned my TikTok adventures. So I've been putting a few things up. I still don't exactly know how it works, but last year, probably a year ago, my buddy Vince was talking to me about my podcast and promotion and things like that. And he, I think he told me his exact words were, dude, people will watch anything. And so that's when I posted a couple things from the club, from the VC that were random, like one was me pouring ice from one cooler to another, one of the big Gatorade coolers, and got thousands of views for that. One with me gripping a tennis racket. Um, one was squeegeeing quartz, and, they, and he was right, they kept getting views, and I don't understand it. So I just been messing around with my tennis page that you can find at Scott Fix Tennis and Pickleball on TikTok. So yesterday, I burned a couple of bagels. I have a bagel every morning, right? So I, I burned a couple, or somebody did. I found them in the toaster and they were burned, kind of black. I'm like, we're gonna find out if people will watch anything. So I simply sat them on the counter and I recorded, <laughs> I recorded those two bagels for 10 seconds. No music, no sound, nothing. And I put a caption on it that said, you just watched two bagels two burned bagels for 10 minutes. And within a very short amount of time, minutes, I had over 200 people sat for 10 seconds and watched two burned bagels. Now these bagels didn't have anything on them. They weren't decorated, they weren't talking, they weren't dancing or singing, they were just burned bagels doing nothing. And a few hundred people viewed those and I got likes like hearts and stuff I just don't get it but it's been a fun experiment and Molly and I posted um another one of this thing called globby it's this stress relief thing it's, it's basically the shape of a of a person called globby it's gray and you can squeeze I like I have it in the car it's like a stress relief ball something like that so we did like a five second one of globby and immediately got a few hundred watches of this fake thing with again no music it's not doing anything so if you're on TikTok I get it I've started to get into it for just killing time I can scroll through and I'll get sports stuff and tennis things and um, I get a lot of Karen things I get a lot of cops 
uh, it chooses things for me. But mostly, mostly sports and tennis. So it does serve a good purpose. I actually, I think it has some value. Some of it is trash, but I'm going to investigate what kind of random things I can put on that people will will watch. I just thought it was, uh, it's just entertaining. It's for it's for my it's for my fun. Um, so lastly, before I get to my usual path of talking about random stuff throughout the week and things I talk to people about, um, is uh, a few podcasts ago I talked about my hatred of yard work, and I don't understand people that spend hours and hours and hours in their yards making them beautiful. I just feel like for me, I've got things I'd rather do, like sit and do nothing. Um, I think I've mowed twice in June just because the weather's been great, haven't had to mow. And that leads me to why the weather's been great, because it hasn't rained. And I keep having these conversations with people and small talk about we need more rain and should rain soon. We haven't gotten any rain and we really need it. And I don't think we do. Why? If it doesn't rain, I don't have to mow my lawn. I don't have to trim. My lawn is brown and it's freaking beautiful and I don't have to touch it. I looked and I mowed my lawn twice and my lawn's tiny. It's not like I have this massive yard. I can do the whole thing and trim it in an hour, maybe a little bit more. But I'm, I'm driving to the track this morning about 7.45 and there is a woman on the corner. She's not even on her yard. She's sort of that section across someone's sidewalk if you've got sidewalks it's that section before the road where like the fire hydrants are and she's down on her hands and knees behind this fire hydrant and i can watch her because i'm going to stop sign one weed at a time individual like picking weeds out around this fire hydrant that's not even on her grass and i just thought isn't there something better to be doing maybe there's not but i just can't i can't figure it out. I see pretty yards and think that looks cool. It'll be covered in snow in three months. What's the point? I'm also a um, super negative dude. So that's probably part of it. But and my friend Judy, she proved this week that yard works no good because she took a little little bit of an injury all because she had to do I think she had to do some yard work and uh, knocked her out of tennis for a bit. So Judy, you you solidified my thoughts on all that yard work, but I bet your yard is amazing. So I still am hoping, I don't want the rain. I get there's bigger things than me, like I suppose crops, gr growing things. I don't eat anything that comes out of the ground. So I don't eat vegetables or I guess fruits come off of trees and the trees in the ground, but I don't count those. I count a fruit like comes out of the sky, like an apple or an orange. I'm talking like green beans, ugh, Brussels sprouts, all anything green I can't do. But I guess we need rain for that stuff and to fill lakes and ponds and I don't know, but I don't want any rain. I want to I want to live in Arizona, no rain, all rock, nothing grows. It's a world of not darkness. I want lots of light and sun and heat, but I don't want anything to grow. Um, so that's my, that's my week of rando stuff that I like to talk about. Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts and my favorite ones are when it's usually two or three friends that are just talking and talk random stuff. My favorite shows are Seinfeld, The Office, Parks and Rec, those types of places, Curb Your Enthusiasm, things that are just, they take the smallest things of daily life and expand on them and that's sort of what I like so that's why I talk about this stuff I do have tennis things and some pickleball and the coaching stuff for sure but it, it's uh I should rename this to call it to it's my podcast I can do whatever I want um so a couple things on the tennis side that came up and this one's brief um you've all heard the term ball hog in any sport, you know, basketball, especially somebody that takes the ball, dribbles too much, shoots too much, doesn't pass the ball, those kinds of things. Um, it came up this week that, um, someone mentioned it to another coach and I 
was just questioning, isn't isn't that a compliment if you're called a ball hog on the tennis court? That's awesome. That means you're getting after it, right? You're going after things. You're stealing things that aren't yours, which is part of tennis. You poach, you steal. Um, if I got called a ball hog, I think I'd be like, heck yeah, I am. Why wouldn't I be? It's not your court. We share this and whoever's got the best shot can get it. Do you think it's a compliment if you were called that? Or is it negative? What is it? Is it positive? What is that? What does that mean to you, ball hog? Because I think it's I think it's a positive. I have a problem when I do these. I get super thirsty. And so when I take a drink, I'm in here by myself and I realize how silent it gets. So I will um I need to come up with a way to tell you all I'm getting a drink. I'm going to do this when I'm getting your drink. Yeah. That means that's going to feel fill the silence of me having to get a drink of water. So think about the ball shot, ball hog thing. I think it's best shot wins. I've always said it. It's not it's not who who decided previously if I see a ball that I feel like I can I know if I get that, this point's over, we win. I'm taking it every time. I'm not going to pass it on because we're good sports. We're not, you know, we're not playing polite tennis. We're, uh, I think there's also a difference in mixed doubles when you've got husband, wife, or, or spouses, or that relationship. I think ball hog is a different term because I've seen a lot of uh, bad behavior and bad play among, whether it's the man or the woman in mixed doubles. Uh, I've seen it both ways. And I think that adds a little a little bit to it. That's a different topic. And if you're interested, I, I think I'm putting together a program at the WAC this fall or this summer. I wanna do one, something titled how to, how to play tennis with your spouse or your partner or whatever we're allowed to call it these days. But how do you play how do you play mixed doubles with that relationship? Not just mixed doubles. There has to be a some sort of connection family-wise or married or engaged, something, because that, that makes it cool. So I'm looking to do that, and we are going to address things like being a ball hog and how to treat your partner. And uh, we've discussed having a, um, a marriage counselor on hand at the end that you can go visit if you struggled and possibly a divorce attorney because that would be kind of fun to have all that stuff there we're not going to push you that way but look for that if you're a WAC member um so my my main stuff this time is if if you saw my my posts this week my video posts they're really about the stresses coaches have of organizing large groups of people I spend a significant amount of my time during the week preparing for groups, multi-court groups, groups, two courts, three courts, multiple pros. And it, it, it is stressful. I've, I've talked to my buddy Tim about it a lot and other coaches, and I actually got probably the most feedback I've ever received from any social media this week on, on this particular topic, and it was really good. So for those of you who chimed in, thanks. I appreciate you listening. It helps me sort of talk about it a lot hopefully makes me better on the court but it's just a huge huge thing to make the time on the court better is is knowing what your students expect out of that and knowing that you've communicated with them what is about to happen um so it really came down to just a, a few things i always was taught and i mentioned it in my my, my different post this week is, so I worked for a, a guy, his name's Tom Cascarano. I call him Boss Man. He's one of my three um, mentors, legends, that sort of helped me get to where I am, which is sitting in my daughter's old room doing a podcast by myself. So yeah, thanks for that. I guess I really haven't gotten that far, but I'm going to keep going. He taught us um, Elf. And I remember I was 20, I don't know, 22, 23 when I went to see Tom. And it was a tough job, great club, a difficult task for somebody young, fairly inexperienced. And he taught us very quickly elf. And that, that means exercise. When you're going to do a group lesson, you have to provide these three things and you can succeed. They've got to get some exercise. 
they have to learn something and they got to have some fun. And that sort of is the basis of everything I do. And I've, I've adapted a little bit that balance a little bit. I'd say exercise has dropped a little lower on my scale. The learning has gone up because I tell everybody I want to coach. I don't want to be a ball feeder. Um, you don't want me if that's, that's what you're looking for. I'm not your guy. Find someone else. But those three things are kind of the guide for me. And so all these, the stress we have on trying to get these things right is super challenging. So now you know that I just took a drink because of lightning bolt. That's pretty awesome. I should have done that so much longer earlier. Um, so the majority of the comments, and I'm just going to read some of them. Um, I've got um, play well and learn something. I've got social interaction, competition, and who else is in the drill? Like they want to know prior who's in it. Who are they going to be working with? Um, the competition versus instruction came up a lot. I had probably 50% say they don't want any competition as far as keeping score. They don't want to keep score. They want to practice. But then the other half says they prefer competition throughout with scoring because it's realistic. Um, I don't keep a lot of score in my groups unless we're serving and returning. I don't play a lot of you know games to 11 or 12 or 15 or whatever we choose. Most of mine are include serves and returns because that's where you score in tennis. I want to be as realistic as possible, but I know some coaches that are just, you know, play a game to seven, find a new partner, game to seven, find a new partner, new drill, game to seven. Great. Just not my style. Plus I'm terrible with math. Those of you who have been on court with me know I never get the score right. And it's always awkward because I'll call it something and you all know it's not. And you have to decide which one's going to tell me. And then it just gets weird. So part of it is my, my doing. Um, I've got the ones that four to a court, which is obviously ideal. Um, I've seen clubs that do six for certain drills, five. Um, if we go over six, we get a second court. Don't want to stand in line. Obviously, that was one that was important to a lot of people is just making sure I'm not standing. Uh, although I will tell you, if you're really good in drills, that time spent sitting out for that short amount of time, whether it's a minute or two and watching, you can learn just as much during that time, watching others do it wrong or right, listening to the coach, than you can playing it. So if you're that person, if you're in a group of five and there's four on and one's at the net post or sitting out, you should be actively engaged and listening and watching because you can learn a lot because you're going to be in for, you know, the next four spots. So I'd encourage you all to try that. Uh, that's not your time to just, you know, look around the club and check the clock and watch other matches. You should still try to be engaged as much as possible. Um, and so a lot of it, uh, people ask, they want court positioning and strategy more than skills. And I'm 100% with that. And in group lesson, you're not going to hear me talk skill a whole lot. And I'm not technical. I will do that privately when we're picking up balls or after the lesson. It might be a text later, hey, I noticed this This might need to be changed, but not in a group. And I, I sort of agree with that. What surprised me was the majority was of the feedback was about the people and the social and the community and interaction with people, which very much surprised me because, at least in my career, my current job, former jobs, it's always the level. It's number one. It's she, she or he isn't good enough to be in this. I'm better than everybody. Um, we can't, we shouldn't let them play again. Why are they in this group? That, those are the complaints we get. If you want behind the scenes of a tennis coach, a manager, a director, any of that, that's what we get every day. But when I ask for feedback, I get, it's just about the fun. And, in, and then I'd ask, I, I had some conversations with people and the level wasn't a thing. All said, fine working with lower levels and it's a good place. Um, I'm gonna read one here. At a lower level, um, work on form placement. At a higher level, I work on footwork, making good contact and playing aggressively. So I think that it's just, I'm, I don't know if I've learned anything from this other than the fun part, huge, the community part, the friendship, the social is 
probably higher up than I thought. But I also, I, I didn't, it's not like I heard from every tennis player on earth, but it was court position and strategy and, you know, pretty positive. I can play with anybody. I can get something out of anybody, with anybody. And I hope people watching, listening on this, start thinking about that. Like if you get put in a drill, that's maybe the level's not perfect for you. Who cares? There's got to be a way, right? Find a way because someday you're going to play a match where the person you play or the people you play aren't very good, but they drive you nuts. And you're going to be hope you went back to that practice and learned that. Um, and remember, you were there once too. If you're a, if you are one of those that really gets bent out of shape about perfect levels, did you start playing tennis? Great. Weren't you there one day? Maybe you should have a little sense of community and help those people get better with you and be nice. Um, and along with that, the stress stuff I mentioned, that's a, that is really a big part of it. Um, it's getting levels right. It's, did we book the courts correctly? Do people know they're coming? Is everybody going to show up? All those things. Our coach is going to show up. There's so much on it. And with all that, it also, I had a conversation with my buddy Shannon, who I've mentioned multiple times. She's one of my favorites. She's the new GM at the WAC, um, has been on this podcast, and I'm hoping to have her back someday. We were talking about this subject with um, our jobs and what's required of us, and she passed on a story of someone, I think it was another GM, passed on to her, basically, when we stress out about this, to understand that I think she said, we're not doctors, meaning we, we, we are not saving people's lives. We're providing an hour and a half, two hours of hopefully enjoyment and some exercise and, you know, entertainment. No one's going to, no one's going to die if the level's not perfect, even though I might feel that way and no one's going to be sick and no one's not going to harm anybody it's not that big a deal and that's my my struggle and some of my coaching friends we have to we always have these discussions that you know what it was it was 90 minutes we didn't get it perfect but the majority of the people enjoyed their time and that's the best we can do but if you're in that world of jumping into to different groups and drills and lessons um i i'll give you two things maybe more make sure you know what you signed up for for instance i do these Scott's shots. So five days a week, Monday through Friday, I have half hour class classes. I have two for the serve. I have a forehand. I have a volley and a backhand. And I have had people show up for serve day. Ask me why? Why are we serving so much? Why aren't we? Why aren't we drilling and hitting ground strokes and playing points? And I sort of like, did you? You signed up for this. You, the only way to sign up for it is to see the title in front of you. This is serves. That's all, that's all we're doing. We're not returning. We're serving. That's it. That's all we do. We focus on that one skill. Um, I have other ones where it's very clear, like Tim and I's title is, you know, match play with Tim and Scott. And we've had a couple people show up and are like, we're playing a match for real. Like we're going to keep score. Uh, look at the title. Look at the description. It clearly says match play. Um, Everyone, everyone you ever do, whatever club you're at, will should have a description of it. And so sign up for the ones that you want. If I teach a class and it says all match play, no drilling, try not to show up and be disappointed that we're not drilling because we told you ahead of time and pick and choose what you like. I think it'll make your time on the court a whole lot, a whole lot easier. Um, so that's sort of that. I, I'd love it if you just and you can comment once this is posted um, on all my stuff or just see me. I actually get more text than I do any um, social media con com comments. Um, so just if you've got more, this is an ongoing thing that will always be there for every coach on earth. Probably every sport has the same, same issues. Water time. It's appropriate too because that's thunder, which leads to rain. Rain provides me water. So there is one good use for rain, and that is so I can be fully hydrated. Um, let's keep going. Really got one more thing on the tennis side of things. So I saw a, 
a video repeated, it must have been recently, it was Novak Djokovic talking about when bad things happen on the court, how to handle them. I did, I, I would lie if I said I listened to the entire thing, but within about 15 seconds, you get the gist of it. And he talks about, starts it off with when, when things go bad on the court, to accept it. Try to just accept that this isn't going the way I want it to, instead of fighting it. Just let it, let it happen and use your practices and your background to fix those things. Um, so I, it got me back to our California trip. We know, knew going in, Shelly and I, the kids, we knew getting in that van on Wednesday afternoon for the next 10 days, we were going to have some dark moments. We were gonna go to some, some difficult places in all of our situations from tired, hungry, to lost, to been in the car so long, to wanting to drive off a cliff. It was just gonna happen in that setting. And I know for me, I was, I was fairly prepared for that, that it's not gonna go the way we expect it to, and we're going to have these. So my, uh, my darkest moment was, I think it was Friday night, somewhere in the crap hole of Kansas. <laughs> Uh, we could not find a place to get a hotel. We were on a two lane road in the middle of nowhere. It was dark, um, nothing's open. There's weather close to us and actual tornadoes hit the ground in places we were and had already been, luckily. Um, couldn't find anywhere to eat. It was rough, it was getting late and dark. We're all tired, we've been driving for 12 to 15 hours. And that was a really dark moment for me, actually. It's the, one of the one times I, I didn't drive and I let Shell drive and I had to, I, not saying I was perfect, I had probably said some bad things and acted like a jerk shortly, but I think I was better than I would have been if I hadn't been prepared for it. Like in my head, I was thinking, here it is. This is, this is that darkest moment where things could go really wrong. And I tried my best to just be quiet and let it happen knowing that we're gonna find a place. Worst case is we, you know, we sleep in the car on the side of the road in Kansas, but I knew that wasn't going to happen. And I started trying to think about how, how could I teach that? And I just, the words that came up, and I think I have it in the right order are prepare. So if you think in your head and you're preparing early on for what am I going to do when these things happen? Because they are going to happen on a court. You're not going to play a perfect match in almost all cases. So you prepare for that. Then when it starts, you accept it. I've, I'm accepting that this, this is not going the way I want it to right now. And then you're, you react to it. What is your reaction? What are you trained to do? What are your keys and sort of steps to get out of that? Mine was to probably be quiet for a bit. I probably played on my phone, tried to sleep, act like I wasn't in the hell on earth that I currently was in. And I think too, letting other people help you. Let your partner help you, right? I was able, Molly and Shell were in the front seat and Molly was navigating and looking on Google and trying to figure it out. And Shelly pulled over and talked to this nice woman at this little motel that had no rooms, kind of a dump, but um, they were, they got us where we needed to be and it didn't have to be me. So especially doubles, maybe your partner can pull you out of that a bit. Uh, and Cause worst case in your life on a tennis court is you lose a match and you've all lost. If you're listening to this, you've lost a match. I've lost a lot of matches. I also won a lot of matches, but We've all lost. You can't. You can't avoid it. We're not gonna go. We're not gonna go six for six like Michael Jordan did in the NBA Finals. I think LeBron's like four out of eighty-five. I'll take six for six. He's the goat famer. If you listen to this, you know it's true. There's no argument for LeBron. Um, but when you get in those places, just prepare for them. Maybe part of your practice sessions should be planning out when it goes bad. What are my steps? Do you take longer breaks? Right? Do you fake a shoe being untied? Right? Do you need that time? Do you speed up? 
Do you get more aggressive? Do you hit harder? How, how are you going to handle those dark, those dark moments? I traditionally don't handle them well, especially as a kid. I did a lot of racket breaking, swearing, acting like a punk. I believe my dad called me a little McEnroe once, took my rackets quite a bit. Uh, I was, I was not good. So sorry about that, mom and dad. I probably embarrassed you quite a bit, but I'm trying to make it, make up for it with my high level of podcast intellect now. Um, so last thing is keep up the, uh, I really enjoy the conversations I've gotten to have on Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, Facebook, just text, heck call me. Let's go for coffee. I got to see my buddy Sean last week and we had some coffee and talked about this stuff. So, um, I don't turn down that kind of stuff, but Hope everything's going well on the court. I mentioned, I think I mentioned, this is episode 49. And that means episode number 50 is coming up. And I'm I'm pretty stoked about that and pretty proud of it that I've been able to do this almost 50 times. I have a request in to three people to join me for number 50. So I have invited, I have to invite my dad. He's the most, um, he's had the most appearances on this show. He needs to be there. I've invited my brother Mark to join us because his couple he was on have the most entertaining, funniest moments of this podcast. And my buddy Ron Flamer Albers, my college tennis coach, who also has been on this podcast by himself. Um, I have going to try to get all three of them on for number 50. My technology skill isn't very high. So to get them all three on Zoom or in some form like that is my goal for my next one, if if possible. So we'll try, and that should be that should be a lot of fun, or it should be completely awful. I don't know. Um, that's all I got, guys. So thanks again. But hold on, I'm thirsty. Aren't you glad you waited for that? It's got to be so annoying listening to this stuff. I'm not sure if you're still listening why you are. That's, uh, I think it's a bad life decision. Enjoy your time on the courts. I will hopefully talk to you with three, uh, three special guests next time, next time y'all hear from me. Talk to y'all later. See ya.